so after covering the national fire protection associations identification system it'd be good to go through now and understand the emergency response guide this is updated every year i know the picture here is old but you can still download this app on your phone or your ipad and i recommend that you do it because it's really easy to go through the screenshots this way um, you can also do it by using the uh, website that's available to you. Emergency Response Guidebook. This video highlights what's new and provides a short introduction on how to use the ERG. First responders use the guidebook during the initial phase of a hazardous materials incident, as always. Resist the urge to rush into the scene and always stay upwind, uphill, and if possible, upstream from the release. Do you have limited information? Can you only see just a placard or ID number or just barely make out the shape of the truck? Following the newly added flowchart will help get information from the correct guidebook page. The new table of contents provides a page number for each section in the guidebook. The book starts with a description of how to read a shipping document on the inside cover and ends with a list of emergency response numbers on page 396. The table of markings, labels, and placards include several new graphics. And you should absolutely have these memorized if you are going to do anything in the hazardous materials world. There's not that many, there's literally nine. Standing out more, the numbers for the guide pages are now shown as white numbers in a black circle. The rail car and road trailer identification charts. And these charts are indispensable. You can see how each vehicle is different and in the difference of its shape tells you what is inside the vehicle so you would not have a vehicle with this amount of ridges in it and actually concentric rings if it wasn't containing something such as um, really low pressures or flammable liquids or maybe even cor corrosives when you have the baffles oh this one's a rail car have new containers and details such as special features, types of fittings, and most importantly, container pressure. Because if you can control the pressure and the temperature, you can control the hazardous materials and therefore the release thereof and the cleanup. Use the new globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals section to quickly identify the hazards associated with the transportation of a material. Recently, the U.S. Department of Transportation adopted portions of the GHS to provide universal warning information for labeling packaging. These symbols, or pictograms, convey specific physical, health, and environmental hazard information so remember those three categories because you will be tested on them as well as where to find the um, nomenclature or words that go with each H code, hazard code, whether it's physical, environmental, or otherwise. And black symbols on a white background with a red frame. The green border tables list chemicals that this part's really important. So remember when we were talking about some of the chemical properties and there are some agents that are stable in transport, but then when they hit um, air or water, they become unstable and therefore it puts them into these green pages. The green pages are the nasty nasties. When they are released, um, responders need to do something immediately. Have a toxic or poison inhalation hazard such as chlorine or anhydrous ammonia. In the 2016 ERG, you will find more isolation distances in the green border table one, and table three has added information from new reactivity research for six gases which are toxic by inhalation. First responders dealing with hazardous material transportation emergencies need quick, correct information personnel responding to the scene need to know what materials they are dealing with 
and what actions need to be taken to help protect themselves and the public and their communities. Having accurate information during the first crucial minutes is necessary to determine reliable recommendations. This information often determines how quickly the incident is resolved. And sometimes minutes matter. So how do we use the 2016 ERG? Well, every ERG you learn to use the same way. So we're going to let this guy show you. Following the new flowchart, we start with our first piece of information. Then we continually revise. So when you start with your first piece of information, they are starting with explosives because they are the ones that are the most volatile. And you can see that they're actually there's not a lot of explosives that are transported, so generally you'll go to no there and then be looking for the UN number. These are decisions as new information becomes available. As the first responders arrive on the scene, they should get as much information as they can from a distance. Do you only know the UN number? If so, then start with the yellow bordered pages. This section... So now you can see how important it is to get your shipping papers or your bill of lading correct because that is the only number that's on the outside of that vessel that a hazardous materials um, responder, uh, firefighter, or most likely a police officer who has limited training in hazardous materials incidents but is the first on the scene. All they have is that number to identify what is inside of the vessel. And whether, whether it's leaking, if it's toxic, if there should be um, standoff distances, or maybe it's dangerous when wet. So all, everything comes down to the bill lading and really getting it the proper name correct, as well as the UN number when filling out your shipping papers. And we'll cover that later. List hazardous material by the UN or ID number with a goal of gathering isolation distances and response recommendations from the orange guidebook pages. If you can read the name of the hazardous material on the container, use the blue bordered pages to locate the chemical information. In this case, the leaking drum of sodium hydroxide has a guide number of 154 if a placard or label is the only information available, flip to pages 8 and 9 to find the corresponding guide number. If limited to identifying only the shape and size of the transport, or which really means you should not enter the vicinity of the area. If you're only identifying the transport by the size and shape of it, you kind of really are guessing what's inside. Now, it could be a pretty good guess, but who wants to guess on their life or the lives of their community? Refer to pages 10 through 13. Match the outline of the rail tank car or road trailer to find the matching guide number. Be aware, if a P is next to a guide number... Well, P is the worst, right? And, and you should know why, because if polymerization occurs it could be a really bad day for people who respond. So these are the nasties of the nasty. The material may suffer a violent polymerization. Monomers such as styrene or vinyl acetate can breach their container if heated or if not inhibited from polymerizing. If the material's name is highlighted in green and on fire, use the appropriate orange guide for evacuation distances. And that's why it's important for everybody to understand the emergency response guide and the nature of the chemicals that are on site because only you as a safety and health professional have a close and intimate relationship with those chemicals. The people who are responding to the incidents do not. They are only going by the UN number or the information that you provide for them. So their lives are at risk more so than your plant. Then, protect in downwind direction according to Table 1 for residual material release. If the material's name is highlighted in green and not on fire, use the isolation and protective action distances from Table 1 
and consult the orange bordered guide to find more safety and response information. So it seems like a lot, but basically you're, if the chemical that you have is highlighted in green, then you need to take a look at the orange tables. If the product includes the reference when spilled in water, read table two for a list of generated gases and do not use water or foam as an extinguishing agent. Finally, on the page following the flow chart, if nobody dies during the incident, don't forget to add contact numbers. Take a minute and list all the cleanup contractors, hazmat teams, rail companies, and any local, state, or federal resources you may need during the time of a hazmat incident as well. So I understand that having a video in a video, um, you could have just watched the video and received that information, but um, the video really just went through the ERG guide in a really interesting and specific way that the only way you can do that is to actually touch the ERG guide. But there are other videos that will help you use the ERG guide and it's available to you or just pick it up and start flipping through it. Remember, it was written for first responders, firefighters, police who really don't know anything about the agent other than the information that's found in these ERG guides. Everybody calls 911, but 911 only knows what you tell them. They're just there to deal with your emergency. And so you use the guidebook just the way it was um, designed to be. And it's just a flow chart with um, yes and no gates that you're able to go through. And the important things to remember here are these green pages or these orange pages. Because if your chemical is highlighted that way, then it is a um, agent which may cause problems for inhalation. And so you can either use um, the technical names such as gasoline or you can look it up um, by UN number. So yellow pages are UN number, blue pages are um, blue pages are the name of the chemicals number. And so then again, you see the orange pages, which give us these three main categories: um, potential hazards, uh, public safety, and emergency response. So these are written for emergency responders, not your um, people in the workplace. Um, they wouldn't see a release like this. They would most likely exit the building and in your B or your responders, which are coming in and taking care of the incident. So these green highlighted agents cannot stress it a lot enough. They are toxic inhalation hazards. They could be chemical warfare agents or water reactive. So when you see that category four, dangerous when wet, we know it's water reactive and automatically we need to go to these green pages and look at what our evacuation distances um, versus um, daytime or nighttime. And it also has a separate section in there for um, whether you have low, moderate or high wind conditions. And that's because if you have a release that hypothetically goes downhill, so it's in this pool or in this bowl, but it's really windy, then we may not have to evacuate that bowl as far. Or if it's really windy and it's blowing stuff downstream, then we need to evacuate more, which is what you see right here. Both day and nighttime conditions, because at night we just basically can't see as far, so we have different um, responses. Again, these are your emergency responsors. The folks within your facility should know how to work with and deal with um, an accidental contamination. And a contamination wouldn't be a major spill of a rail car. It'd be maybe a ripped glove. And so these are where the difference is. National Fire Protection Association, those first responders, fire and police, we use the DOT um, placards and we use the emergency response guide. So you got to keep in mind again this polymerization and those are just agents which are typically um, 5.2 so they're spontaneously combustible.
to bear stress, right, that makes it useful as a clothing fiber, for example, or the ability to entangle, to give it rubbery properties, which makes it useful as your shoe sole. All of those things come from the long chain nature. And so once you begin to understand that, you begin to see what makes polymer special. Polly fur. Polly fur. Polly fur. Polly fur. <laughs> So if you apply uh, shear force uh, slowly, it will flow as a liquid. Whereas if you apply shear force quickly, the chains will entangle and it will behave as a solid. Rubber bands are made out of a polymer. When it gets really cold, these chains, they can't slide past each other anymore. They're locked in place. This is sodium polyacrylate, an amazing polymer which when added to water, becomes 300 times its size. When about two tablespoons are added to a vase, you can see that the water immediately begins to solidify into a gel. But what if I grab a large bowl and submerge my hand in it while the chemical reaction takes place? Let's find out. Polyacrylate is also known as water lock. You might see plumbers using it on a daily basis to aid in the removal of standing water. I've went ahead and added some blue dye to the water to better demonstrate the chemical reaction for you. After adding several scoops of the powder, I place my hand into the bowl and cover it with water. The polyacrylate immediately absorbs the contents of the bowl, which would be very helpful in a flooding situation or an overflow. But one of the most amazing things about this is that we can add salt to it and reverse the process. Check this out. After adding tons of salt and mixing, we wound up breaking down the gel and having H2O again. Check out some of our other chemical reactions here, and let us know in the comments what you'd like to see next.